So, you own an Atari 2600 and you want to hook it up to something other than a CRT television for video capture or gameplay. You elect to use an upscaling device like a FrameMeister or a RetroTINK. The goal of devices such as these is to take an older video signal like 240p or 480i and convert it to a higher resolution that is more compatible with modern televisions and capture devices. An external scaler serves as a bridge between old and new. The benefits of using one versus connecting an old console directly to a modern television include superior image quality and a reduction in perceptible delay, or lag, in the time from player input on the controller to the visual response on the screen. Once you manage to figure out all the connections, you fire up the system. Things seem okay, most of your games work, but you hit a snag with this game here or that game there. Something is wrong with the video signal. What is causing the problem? The Atari, the scaler, the television? Why are there problems with some games? Most of the games seem to work just fine. The short answer is that CRT TVs are rather forgiving when it comes to the required specs of the video signal that you feed them versus more modern display technology. Oh, and by the way, there is also no such thing as 240p. You want the long and detailed answer? Well, welcome to Displaced Gamers. The Atari VCS, later renamed the 2600, hails from an era when console gaming was the new frontier, a period of exploration for both hardware and software developers. What was deemed acceptable for video output to a CRT television at the time presents a few challenges for a scaler to handle in the modern era. Many of the challenges presented by the Atari 2600 as well as other consoles can be traced back to one important part of the video signal. Vertical Sync this signal influences the vertical refresh rate of the video output and whether or not the video is progressive scan or interlaced. If you are unfamiliar with terms such as these, I highly recommend watching the 525 line analog video episode on this very channel. I've placed a link for it in this video's description. 525 lines are used to deliver two fields of information that, when woven together, produce an interlaced image on the TV screen. As there are two fields, there are two instances of vertical sync in this signal. Lines 1 through 9 contain vertical sync used for the first field's information. The second vertical sync occurs at the midway point of line 263 and ends at the midway point of line 272. The difference of when the vertical sync begins relative to the start of the horizontal line determines which field to use and therefore where to draw the image on the screen. Does vertical sync start at the beginning of the line? Draw to field 1. Does vertical sync start at the middle of the line? Draw to field 2. Game consoles that desire progressive scan, including the Atari 2600, start vertical sync at the same location on the scan line in order to continue to draw picture information to the same place on the screen. Let's alter an interlaced signal to create a progressive signal using field 1 as our field of choice. Since field 1 normally ends at the midway point of line 263, on which line do we start the next vertical sync signal to repeat drawing to field 1 and create 240p? Maybe we pull the end of field 1 back half a line and turn line 263 into line 1 of the next frame. Maybe we push it forward half a line and turn line 264 into line 1 of the next frame. Let's use a generic formula to get a rough idea of the difference in vertical refresh rate. For a system using 525 line analog video, typically paired with NTSC color, the horizontal scan rate, that is how fast the scanning beam in the display sweeps from one side to another, is 15 kHz. Our field examples are 262 lines and 263 lines. So divide the horizontal scan rate by the number of lines in the field and you get a vertical refresh of 60.05 and 59.82. To which of these two examples are we referring when we say 240p? Trick question. It could be either. 240p is an umbrella term we created in the modern era to encompass tweaking 525 line video to produce an image with progressive scan. Many consoles allow a programmer to select a graphics mode and the console will handle the analog video output timing. The Atari 2600, however, puts vertical sync, when it occurs and for how long, in the hands of the programmer. A document called Stella Programmer's Guide, written by Steve Wright in 1979, explains how to program for the Atari 2600. It provides a basic diagram for how 262 scan lines are used by the Atari 2600, including 192 for picture information. The timing of the Atari's machine cycles and clock counts is laid out relative to the scan lines sent to the television. 
The breakdown of how many of the 262 scan lines used for each area is on the right. Why is all this information provided? While many consoles that followed the Atari 2600 may have used things like VRAM, frame buffers, etc. in order to handle graphics on a per-frame basis, the Atari's graphics are handled on a per-line basis. The Atari's processor must send the data for the line to be drawn to the screen to the Television Interface Adapter, or TIA chip, which converts the data into a video signal. There is no video RAM. The data in the TIA chip pertains to the line being drawn to the screen. Because of this, the processor must be ahead of the electron beam of the TV for each line being drawn. If you wrote a book about Atari, you might call it Racing the Beam. By the way, if you're into Atari and console history and technology, I'd recommend reading this one. This diagram illustrates a time frame for the processor and TIA chip for each scan line as well as the breakdown of a compatible signal to send to the television. How do the processor, TIA, and television work in harmony? Since the processor and the TIA have to be synchronized on a line-by-line -line basis, but processor execution time for various instructions is unpredictable, Atari provided the WSYNC register to halt the processor and wait for the horizontal sync signal that starts the next line of video in order to keep the processor and the TIA synchronized. Fortunately, the TIA handles the timing of horizontal sync for us. The processor can write to the WSYNC register, which will set the ready line low and halt the processor. The TIA chip continues to finish drawing the current line of video. When the horizontal sync pulse hits for the next line, TIA sets the ready line high and the processor resumes execution. As you know, it is up to the programmer to signal when it is time for vertical sync to occur. Code must signal the start and stop of VSync so the TIA can send the vertical sync signal to the television so the television knows to return the electron beam to the top of the screen and start drawing the next frame. On that note, I want to cite a section of the Stella Programmer's Guide concerning vertical timing. When the electron beam has scanned 262 lines, the TV must be signaled to blank the beam and position it at the top of the screen to start a new frame. This signal is called vertical sync and the TIA must transmit this signal for at least three lines. This is accomplished by writing a 1 to D1 of VSync to turn it on, count at least three lines, then write 0 to D1 of VSync to turn it off. The minimum of three scan lines for VSync, as well as a total scan line count of 262 for a single frame, weren't really required. Since the duration of VSync, as well as when it occurs, were flexible to the programmer, the programmers flexed them. While a CRT is designed to have some forgiveness for any discrepancies in line count or frame rate, straying from 262 at 60 Hz wasn't a big deal. A modern display can devote a bit of time to image processing in order to preserve compatibility at the cost of lag. Finding the sweet spot between eliminating lag and preserving signal compatibility is the make or break task handed to a scaler. Atari games took a Wild West approach to a scan line count and vertical refresh rate, and the CRT televisions of the time handled the signal. To separate these two seems wrong, but we aren't here for philosophy, we're here for technology. Let's see what we can do. The signal chain created for this video consists of an Atari, the RetroTINK 5X Pro Scaler, an ASUS PA248QV monitor, and an Elgato Game Capture HD. The monitor is a 16 to 10 aspect ratio monitor that can take 1200p, but we are upscaling to 720p just to keep the old Elgato device happy. The purpose of this configuration is not to demonstrate how to have the best image quality proper aspect ratio, etc. I'm interested only in showing a few examples of Atari games that output a rather questionable V-Sync for the modern era. I'll also reference the Atari 2600 emulator Stella on occasion as the software can show the number of scan lines and the refresh rate during gameplay and has the ability to debug Atari games. And yes, we're going to be looking at a little bit of assembly code while we're at it. To kick off, the 5X Pro is set to the following settings. We're going to start with the vertical sync setting set to frame lock mode. What is frame lock mode? From the RetroTINK 5X's manual, frame lock utilizes the video ADC and console as the base clock. The output frame rate follows the original console exactly with a fixed lag of approximately a quarter frame. Frame lock may not be compatible with some TVs and capture cards depending on the console's frame rate. What does this mean? 
Do you wish to break frame lock mode? Well, then throw an Atari 2600 at it. Asus monitor on the left, captured footage on the right. Games like Combat or River Raid are pretty close to standard when it comes to video output. Stella has combat firing at 263 scan lines per frame at a rate of 59.8 Hz. River Raid runs at 262 scan lines at 60 Hz. Both of these games seem to maintain consistent output, and that is also important when it comes to upscaling, converting, and showing video output from the Atari. That said, our interest lies with what will break this setup. First up, The Empire Strikes Back. The objective is to take down the Imperial Walkers, either by firing a large number of shots or targeting a weak point that flashes for a brief period. Let's see what happens when we take down this walker. Wow, the monitor cut out for a few seconds while the walker was flashing and eventually resynchronized with the signal. What happened? Let's do the same thing using Stella. The game appears to run at 261 lines at 60.2 Hz. If I take out this walker, the game shifts to 260 lines at 60.5 Hz. So the game literally drops one scan line for a few seconds as the walker is flashing and then immediately returns to the stock speed after the walker has been completely destroyed. The monitor either couldn't lock to 60.5 Hz or just didn't get enough frames to do it and eventually regrabbed the 261 lines at 60.2 Hz. Meanwhile, the capture device handled the signal just fine. The RetroTINK output frame rate followed the console output frame rate as it said it would. The monitor couldn't handle it, but the capture device could. Not a problem with the Atari game scaler monitor or capture device, simply an incompatibility when facing modern signal standards in one of two devices at the end of the chain. Let's do the same test but with the RetroTINK's vertical sync setting set to triple buffer mode. As described in the manual, Triple Buffer offers the highest compatibility across all equipment and immunity against sync loss resolution changes at the expense of increased lag and occasional judder due to the need to repeat or drop frames. In short, this should help us with our compatibility check. Let's try Empire again but use Triple Buffer mode. Ah, this time we did not lose sync. The walker was destroyed and thankfully the monitor was not. If you look closely, you can see the lines shift upward as the walker is flashing and then settle down in place after it disappears. Once again, the Atari 2600 works on a line-by-line -line basis. Empire shifts from 261 lines to 260 lines to 261 lines in less than 2 seconds. It means nothing to a CRT, but it can cause issues with modern tech. The idea of dropping a single scan line during an animation sequence may seem crazy to many of you, but it was perfectly normal and gamers were oblivious to it 40 plus years ago. Funny thing about Empire, it is a rather tame example of a non-standard signal. Yeah, it gets better. Let's return to frame lock mode on the scaler and try Buck Rogers Planet of Zoom. This one has problems. The Elgato checked out. In fact, I ran several games after this and the capture device failed to sync with anything until I power cycled it. Meanwhile, the monitor really wrestles with this one. The title screen and level screens take a moment for sync to lock. Gameplay also needs a bit of warm up before it seems okay. What is happening here? Let's check the emulator. Wow, the title screen runs in 240 scan lines at 65.5 Hz. That is a noteworthy change compared to a mock standard 262 lines at 60 Hz. The level screen is really crazy. It seems to alternate rapidly from 248 scan lines at 63.4 Hz to 249 scan lines at 63.1 Hz. Finally, the gameplay appears and runs at a rate of 262 lines at 60 Hz. It is no wonder the title to level to start of gameplay sequence caused so many problems. Vertical sync timing is all over the place. The Elgato decided to just go home, and it took a bit of coaxing to get it back. Let's try this again with triple buffer mode. Hey, not perfect, but a lot better. Both the monitor and the capture device held sync, and the only noteworthy glitches happened during the level 1 screen, and this makes sense as the screen tick-tocks between resolutions and refresh rate. Speaking of which, Battle Zone is a bit of a battle. Frame lock mode definitely has issues, and this time even triple buffering mode can't save it. What is going on here? Stella states the game runs at 262 lines at 60 Hz, however this doesn't really tell the story. Let's take a look at how VSync is handled in code. This is the source code for River Raid. 
The Stella programming manual mentioned how to go about implementing VSync by writing a 1 to D1 of VSync to turn it on and a 0 to D1 to turn it off. The time between on and off should be 3 scan lines. In River Raid, VSync works as follows. WSync waits until horizontal sync fires for a new line. A value of 82 is written to VSync to start vertical sync. WSync is executed for three lines, and then zero is written to VSync to end it. A key element here is that WSync goes first, so the machine waits for the start of the next line and then begins VSync. The timing is important here. Simply saying, well, time for VSync, and starting somewhere after the start of the line can upset frame rate consistency. Now the code doesn't have to fire WSync and only WSync on three consecutive lines. It can execute other code between the horizontal sync pulses. Any problems encountered with various titles are likely to stem from an inconsistent VSync start time each frame and or insufficient vertical sync duration. Here's the code for battle zone. VSync starts here and ends here. Some code is executed inside the scan lines designated for VSync and between the occurrences of horizontal sync. As mentioned, this is normal. However, note there is no WSync to wait for the start of a scan line before the start of VSync. The result of this is that VSync has an inconsistent start time. This also means that the first would-be scan line for VSync is not a full scan line in terms of time, and the three scan lines for VSync's duration come up a bit short. With a bit of debugging, we can find the basic range of possibilities for vertical sync. None of them reach three scan lines. So we end up with a rather bouncy signal in terms of consistency. Well, since vertical sync is controlled by the code, why don't we just reprogram that part of the game really quick? I made some adjustments to the timing of vSync and the looping logic for the code that takes place during the execution of vSync in Battlezone. This should give us at least three lines of vertical sync and a consistent start time. As the graphics are drawn per line and dependent on time, they will definitely need some tweaking after this change, but if we execute the modified game on real hardware right now, vertical sync is fine, timing is consistent. The capture device and the monitor show the game, and both triple buffer and frame lock modes work properly. As you can see, my radar needs to have horizontal timing compensated after the change to vSync timing, but the game is stable. Fortunately, I'm not the first person to modify Atari assembly code and change vSync timing. Various members of the Atari community have tackled several of the games that exhibit vSync problems, and Battlezone is one of them. As of this video, you are at the mercy of finding the appropriate thread at the Atari Age forums containing the changes for the game you need fixed, but hopefully that will change in the future. Now obviously this method requires that one either own a flash cart or replace the original ROM inside their cartridge, but at least it offers a way to play problematic games on original hardware while also taking advantage of the higher image quality and minimized lag courtesy of a modern scaler. If you programmed the game in 1980 and it worked as expected on mid 20th century technology, but then later struggled when came to 21st century technology, is the problem really a bug? At what part of the signal chain do you fix? the problem. Fortunately, we have the ability to attack the issue on multiple fronts, via the code of the game and the feature set of a modern scaler such as the RetroTINK 5X Pro. As we pursue compatibility for Atari 2600 games and display technology of the modern era, we also get a chance to see just how subjective 240p is. It's a digital term created to represent a much larger analog world. Until next time, thanks for watching. <music>